OctoSR Day 11. How to get started. Next up, the primer talks about how to get started in an OSR system. There are five or six different things, but I'm only going to focus on two of them. The first of which is read the rules clean. Read the rules as though you've never seen them before. Why is this important? Well, after 3rd edition, after 4th edition, after 5th edition, after the wash of D20 clones, after the plethora of OSR and faux OSR, that is false OSR, tomes came out, a lot of things that are taken for granted in role-playing games are not in the original editions. Think about Attacks of Opportunity. A few days ago, I talked about a Red Caps episode where the Attack of Opportunity was discussed. In BX, they don't talk about Attacks of Opportunity. Instead, it's initiative-based. If you declare that you're running away and I win the initiative, that means I strike you at a bonus. It doesn't mean that if you win the initiative, you run away and I get to strike you. According to the rules as written, according to Kevin. That's not the first time that Kevin has done that for me either. Another time he did an episode a year or so ago talking about ability adjustment. In BX and most subsequent editions, you can reduce certain stats to improve your prime requisite, thereby getting a bonus and getting a better XP uh, for your prime rec. In the original edition, it doesn't say actively reduce and in an interview he found, again, I'm just going to say that Kevin talked about this, you're going to have to go find the episode yourself. In an interview, Gary talked about how that could account for a smart, wily fighter, someone who might not be the strongest or the toughest, but who uses his wits and learns quickly. And so you have these different archetypes. Not every warrior is muscle-bound uh, Conan. Think of uh, Elric. That's probably a bad example because, you know, he's the elf prototype, but uh, maybe uh, maybe the Grey Mauser. He's a fine swordsman, despite being more of the inspiration for the thief. You don't have to have a beefy fighter every time. It allows you to have a beefy cleric. It allows you to have a wise magic user, as opposed to all of the different classes falling into this same kind of stat pyramid where you're trying to maximize your XP gain. In the original edition, uh, this is where this is different, and the original edition, you don't get as much for your stats. In BX, you get a bonus to, uh, to hit with melee, with strength and damage, and you get the uh, dexterity for ranged attacks more easily. In od and it's not the case. It, you have to get much higher stats to get a bonus, and most characters are going to be level-based. Your Thacko is going to be much more important than your strength, and the level that you gain that Thacko is what's going to drive your advancement. When you realize this, the different versions of the game have different objectives. BX is more of the dungeon crawly type game. It's more of the mud core. It's more of the pathetic aesthetic. OD&D very rapidly, especially if you're using chainmail, turns into heroic fantasy. Uh, the chainmail rules once you get to that hero stage, you can fight on the fantasy combat table and you can take down a dragon that you didn't have a chance to take down before. So there are facets of the game. Uh, uh, Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Famously, strength is not applied to attacks and fighters are the only ones who get a bonus. That's because Lamentations is trying to enforce a particular aesthetic, a particular experience, and all of the supplementary material for Lamentations is going to try to reinforce that same experience. So. When walking into an OSR game, it's very important to read the rules for what they are with a fresh mind. That way you can hit the zen of the experience that the designers were intending you to have. Is this experience going to be the same as subsequent versions of the same game? Oh goodness, of course not. Third edition is nothing like fourth. First edition is nothing like fifth. But that's okay. They're different games and that's by design. Find the edition that promotes the style of play you like and hit it with an open heart. Try to avoid house ruling it until you have it down so that you understand the house rules you put in place are not going to compromise the vision that the game is supposed to produce. If you want to produce a different vision, go right ahead. 
I would recommend looking around, making sure there's not a system that's closer to what you want so that your house ruling a little bit less. Uh, you have a more concise experience. Heavens, maybe you find an experience that just produces what you thought you needed to homebrew. Uh, that would save you time in finding a community. But I digress. The important part of this story is read the rules for what they say, not for what you assume they would say. Because the experience you're going to have is going to change. The most obvious experience of this for me has been my Ash Coast games. Using the man-to-man -man tables, using concurrent hits, as the rules don't technically say, that's changed the nature of the experience. It's changed the way that my players plan. It's changed, and I'm very excited because I think that after a certain treasure roll, a couple of them should level up. And I'm excited to see how that experience turns out once they get into a more heroic zone. Moving in, we're in a traditional game, you're not going to move. Parrying, attacking, switching weapons out, like you wouldn't necessarily see in an ACS game. The experience is totally different, and I'm enjoying it. I'm really having fun, and I'm having to hold back a little bit because, you know, life is happening. But once we get through the current storm, we'll get right back to the table, and the table is where you want to be. Thank you for listening. Delve on. SR October, part 12. Because it's not really days, is it? If I'm not doing them every one. <laughs> Day 12. How to get started. The second half of this particular bullet point, how to get started, though I want to focus on the very last thing that the primer says. Run the adventure and enjoy. Now, the author is referring to Tomb of the Iron God, a uh, swords and wizardry adventure that parallels the release of this particular primer. I have not played it personally. I'm sure that it is up to par, so you can definitely run it. But the key here that spoke to me about this is run the game. In newer editions of the game, moreover, in the culture of the newer editions, you have to have more. You have to have backstories for the characters. You have to have characters that are integrated into the setting. You have to have history so it makes sense as to why people are in places. You have to have demographics. You have to have interwoven relationships. Those things do exist in OSR type games, but they don't have to. And moreover, they don't come up when you're starting the game. When you start, when you are beginning your campaign, your level one player characters, they don't need a backstory. They don't need a society to fit into. They're just down on their luck or crazy and going into the ground looking for gold. While that may seem a little uh, crass, a little base in their motives, that's fine. There's always room to be a hero later when you grow out of that initial phase. When starting a dungeon crawler, all you need is a dungeon. A town, a dungeon, and you're good. Because the barrier to entry is low, you get to run the game faster. One of the seminal pieces of advice that's given by the original authors, prep a level or two ahead and don't worry about the rest. Perfection is, and this is where the quote ends, and I'm quoting myself, perfection is the enemy of good. In the same sense, prep is the enemy of play. Don't worry about having a perfect world. Don't worry about having intricate plots and interesting NPCs. Those will come with time. By trying to create them, by trying to write a fantasy novel into which your players can insert themselves and experience, that's going to stop you from playing. That's going to deny you the emergent narrative in favor of set pieces. And thinking about it the same, the more players act, the less they stick to the script.
That is, they're going to do the exact opposite of whatever you think they're going to do. They're going to engage with the NPCs that don't matter. They're going to ignore plot hooks that you thought they would love. They're going to make a mess of your world. So the more effort you put into the prep, the more is going to go to waste. Is all of it going to go to waste? Of course not. They're going to run into a lot of it. They're going to enjoy a lot of it. And player, a lot of players will enjoy that exploration factor. I'm one of them. I love uncovering stuff about the world that we're in. But for every ten things you put in, they're going to find maybe three tops. Uh, two is probably more likely. And you don't want to necessarily do all that work for nothing. Sure, you can reuse it in other places, you can rehash it, but why do that? Prep is the enemy of play. Let the questions arise and answer them as you go, taking notes along the way and creating the world organically. Have your themes. Stick to your themes, but don't allow the absence of answers to prevent you from tackling the questions. As my example of play for this episode, I'm going to showcase two campaigns. My Conquest of Cain campaign and my Ash Coast campaign. The Conquest of Cain was the first game that I ran for friends in Florida after we moved down. It's a series of islands in my home setting that are occupied by an enterprising and seafaring culture, the Canish. So they do their thing, they explore, the party adventures around for a year or so, and then things go south in my life, and I can't run for a while. That's okay. Uh, babies get born, and the twin... You can actually see this on my blog <laughs> at about the six-month mark. The uh, blog posts get super excited about being able to run the uh, home game again. And so... You start seeing stuff like, oh, I'm going to run my game soon. Oh, I'm in the VTT now. Oh, I'm almost doing this. I'm prep, prep, prep. And I posted a bunch of useful stuff that I could have used, but the trick is I didn't use it. That game never got back off the ground. That game did not survive the break I had to take when my kids were born and when uh, after my mom died. It just didn't work. And why is that? Well, was I trying to be perfect? Was I trying to get all of my ducks in a row? You could say that. I have a huge hex map that's only half populated still that I was trying to get down. I wanted to get as much prep as I could do in advance so that I could run the game not knowing how much time I would have to prep going into the game. Which is a fair thought, but it didn't work. Prep was the enemy of play. I never started the game again. One of the, uh, one of the co-workers who played with me in that game no longer lives in the city. One of the other co-workers is in a different company, and that game probably will not start up again anytime soon. Or at least not in the meat space. Contrast that to the Ash Coast. I, another part of the same milieu, same cultures, you have the Canish, the Demotic, the uh, Busha land, same principles, same deities, a lot of the same notes, but the difference is the game's actually running. And I have the players to thank for this. Specifically, thank you Thaddeus for kind of kicking me in the tush and pushing me to actually run the game. I enjoy running the game. I'm having a blast. It's a little nerve-wracking getting started again after having been gone for so long and been inconsistent for so long. And I'm, I'm in a little bit of a dry spell at the moment. This is being recorded the weekend of the hurricane that came through. And so a little bit of a dry spell right now, but I'm enjoying running the game again. And I don't have all the answers. I have some of my old notes for BX. I have some of my old notes for DCC. That doesn't necessarily fit into OE and Chainmail, but I didn't let that stop me. I'm adapting it as I go. I'm providing information as people ask for it, and to be truthful, I kind of owe everybody an apology because I'm saying LBBs, but that's not entirely true. There's some weird house rules I haven't written down entirely. There's some uh, Chainmail assumptions that I've made that I haven't necessarily conferred with everybody. And so there's a lot of information that's just kind of kind of free-floating and make it up as we go until we can get into a groove. Could I have created a groove given a long enough time? Yes. But that time, Lord knows, how, who, how long would that time take? What I can tell you, the conquest of Cain never... Uh, 
never came back. Ash Coast, four or five sessions in. I forget how many as of the time of this recording, but four or five sessions in, and I have a hex map. It's not filled out. It's almost ready for prime time. It'll be ready, hopefully, just in time for when the players get ready for hex crawling. The moral of the story is, can you ever have enough to be ready for a campaign? No. But do you have enough to be ready for the campaign? And that answer is a resounding yes. Regardless of how many notes you take, no matter how much the script is blank, every session you run, you get better at improvising. And with that, I'll improvise my outro. <laughs> Delve on, everybody, and thanks for listening. OSR October, Episode 13. How do I find a game? Now that is a question that has as many different answers as you have people you can ask it. The folks who I know who played back in the 70s, they talk about the relative ease that you could find a group with. There was not a lot of persecution either. Uh, one in particular comes to mind, uh, Rick Stump over at the Don't Split the Party. He and his wife, one of their initial uh, connection points was that they played D&D together. And then in the 80s, I know some folks who started then, and there was a little bit of the satanic panic stuff going on. Most of the horror stories about books getting stolen or burned or uh, getting stuffed into lockers come from there. But when I started, I started then in the 1990s. And while I didn't get shoved into many lockers, uh, I was far too big for that. D&D &D wasn't something you advertised that you did. If you talked about it too much at school, you could have uh, concerned people asking your parents questions. Uh, if you mentioned it at church, then you could have some uh, repercussions there coming out of ignorance of the satanic panic. It's fun to walk face first into the remnants of said satanic panic. <laughs> but really, the hardest thing for me at the time was keeping a stable group. Because one of the things about playing prior to our modern era is the impossibility of communication on the internet. When I was playing in the 90s, the internet wasn't a thing. Sure, it existed, but nobody had it. I mean, well, one of my buddies had it. We would go over to his house and look at websites on his Dreamcast in the middle of the night. But that was about it. That was about as much exposure to the internet as I had. I distinctly remember I had a group in uh, 96, 95, somewhere in there, and we would play at somebody's house until they moved on to some other things. And if they forgot to invite me, then you can't just ping somebody and pop on. You had to drive over. You had to plan for it. And then I'd, uh, I ran my first game in 97 or 98, and... It was my brother, me, and one of his friends. Then, uh, But his friend couldn't always come over. We didn't have a consistent schedule. And although my brother and I played a lot that summer, when school came back around, he kind of moved off and did his own thing. And so then I found some other friends at school who would play with me. And we played at lunch briefly and in the basement on weekends. And that was going great until two, one of them moved away and one of them switched uh, periods. So one of the, his lunch was at a different increment than ours was. So the group disbanded naturally. And man, it was not until college that I was able to have a consistent stable. For all of the good groups that I had, I had at least two failed groups. Because there were some guys that I played with at lunch briefly who were big into the uh, Wuxia stuff. I'm, I'm just not into that. And I sat down with them, and the first they had me roll a character, and they said, "Okay, roll this uh, thirty sider and this ten sider." I was like, "Okay, uh, three zero. You have three hundred hit points." And I'm like, "I am playing a different game than what was advertised." <laughs> but good, good on them. I'm glad that uh, they were having fun. It wasn't my thing, but they were having fun. I'm pretty sure it wasn't D and D, but again, we're just harking right on back. The end story is. There were as many groups or more 
that didn't work out as did. And it was a constant, I mean a constant struggle for me in the 90s and 2000s to get a group together. Fast forward when I got to college. That was the golden era. I found a friendly local gaming store. There was a bunch of folks who'd been playing together for a long time. Got in with one of those groups. We had four different DMs. And the biggest problem we had was finding time during the week to fit everybody's game in. A lot of folks were working. Most of us were students. And so it was one or two games a week tops. And man, that was a good time. Now, the group did change. We had some core folks come in, but they kind of phased out when they graduated and moved off. Uh, we had some other folks phase in, and then they disappeared for reasons that we didn't ever find out about, actually. I bumped into one of them at lunch a year or two later. He was polite, but I guess I, eh, I don't know, found new friends, I guess, better than me. <laughs> but we had a core group, and that was key. Uh, we had a few people come and go, but we had a core group, and we had a good group, and uh, it kept going. Now, how do you get into a group like that in the absence of a friendly local gaming store to accidentally fall into? When I was still in Georgia, and after I became the guy who got a job and graduated and moved away, my first experience was with Meetup, and that actually went pretty well. We found a board game group, because board games are more popular, I guess, and that board game group turned out to be a bunch of solid folks. Uh, we played a couple Pathfinder games, we played a bunch of board games as kind of expected, and didn't ever get to do any TSR stuff with them, but that's okay. At the end of the day, it's more important for people, in my opinion and experience. It's emblematic of a simpler time, too because you had me uh, and a couple others who fit into the same kind of mold, uh, you know, professional types, married, uh, churchgoers, and then you had some group members who were more non-traditional. <laughs> you had some half-shaved heads and some crazy colors in the hair, and needless to say, we didn't agree on everything we talked about, but we agreed on the games. We enjoyed the games. I remember being told by one of the group that... I was different. Um, they had never encountered somebody who uh, fit my mold and still enjoyed D&D type games. <laughs> so that, uh, that tells you because the game appeals to all walks of life. You have uh, folks like me, folks who are more traditional, more conservative, folks who are less traditional, less conservative, and you have all you have blue collar, white collar, technical, non-technical. The game appeals to anybody, uh, regardless of what we may think. But I promised that I wouldn't get political, so I'm going to slow down there and just say it was a good time to have a face-to-face -face conversation, play those kind of games, and bond on those, those shared interests. After moving to Florida, uh, we tried Meetup again. That didn't quite work out. Uh, there was a board game group, but it was really kind of tight-knit, and there were some folks who had specific games that they wanted to play, and they all knew each other. As It didn't, it didn't work out. But um, the next place I went was work, interestingly enough. So I'm, I am one to kind of hide my nerd hobbies. Uh, like I mentioned, there was usually consequences if you talked about D&D in public when I was younger, and that's kind of a hard memory to shake. And the co-workers, though, who didn't experience that, didn't know. And they talked about the gaming, they talked about fantasy films, they enjoyed Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, they enjoyed... Uh, someone mentioned the Bashki version, so I knew I was in on something there, and we were talking about the Elder Scrolls, and I said, do you guys want to try the tabletop version? Now, I ended up running DCC for that group, and they had a blast. We, I recruited some normies. It really worked out. One of my players uh, was had men, brought his home dice. He had played way back in the day, but hadn't played in a while since himself moving to Florida. One of my other players who had never played before, he asked for graph paper. He was our party mapper. Didn't even have to be uh, questioned. His notes were better than mine, so I ended up cheating a little bit. <laughs> to make the game more consistent uh, by looking at his notes because we kind of kept them in the same file. So sometimes normies will work, sometimes normies don't work. Uh, talking back to 
spouses. Um, I've played with spouses before, but never my own. Um, I My wife enjoys puzzle games. My wife enjoys seek and find. So I thought, surely, the exploration and puzzle-solving aspects, maybe we'll have her play a thief. Nope. She was never into it. I uh, could never get her to play. She came and observed and uh, said it was interesting, but didn't want to play. And I don't fault her. I think we all have those same people in our lives who we think will enjoy something, but they don't. And who knows, maybe they enjoy the wrong thing. One of my other players was constantly trying to get me to run 5th edition. I, no shade on 5th edition. Well, yes, I, I throw a lot of shade on 5th edition, but that's not the point. At the time, I wasn't doing it because... Again, it's it's not my thing, but that doesn't mean it's not somebody else's. Um, and so he would go on to play in a couple 5th edition games outside of the game I was running, and more power to him. But that brings us into our next phase of uh, the, the game cycle. How do I play a game that's not the mainstream? Because you, if you're in a physical environment, unless you live in who gaming mecca, you are not going to be able to find someone who wants to play a 40-year-old game with you. It, you can maybe find a couple. You can, like I said, recruit the normies. But most of the time, you're going to have an uphill battle because there's a natural inclination that new is good, that big is good. And coming into a niche hobby like this, it's just not something that is easy to sell every time. And um, my home game with DCC, we cycled players. I had the three core guys that I mentioned, but then we had one, uh, one or two other coworkers that came through and didn't want to play. One coworker who expressed interest but never showed up, uh, and then we had another f two friends of one of my players who came in, played one session, and left. So it's not easy to sell uh, your niche games in an environment where people know about the big dogs. Enter the age of the internet. If you know anything about my history, you'll know, you'll know that I play a lot online. For an entire year, I didn't get to play because twins. And that entire year, I was trying to figure out how am I going to get a game together? How am I going to get into a game? I don't want to play the games that the guys at work are playing. Uh, okay, I actually eventually did cave and tried to go to one, and then I had to cancel because they were going to meet up at 8. I got ready to go at 8, and one of the one of the twins woke up, and he was not going back to sleep. So I spent the next hour playing with a baby instead of going to play the game, and it's just how that goes. So enter Discord. Watching a lot of actual plays, uh, I got into actual plays as a way to vent that lack of playing frustration to try to see other people enjoying what I used to do. And I noticed that some of the content creators that I watched, uh, Hobbs comes to mind, The Gamerhood, uh, Dungeon Musings, uh, Kevin Madison comes to mind, they were playing a lot of awesome games and they both had communities that they advertised. So. I'll give it a shot. Uh, other forums that I was on were saying that Discord was the worst thing and you should avoid it like the plague. So I downloaded the app, made an account, and lo and behold, I really enjoyed being a part of those communities. I jumped into the audio dungeon where I still am, jumped over to Dungeon Musings. I'm not as active over there, but I'm still there. And I'm in six or seven at this point. And I found those communities. Uh, I made my own, which all of you listeners, you're welcome to come in. I'd love to have you come in, hang out, and talk old school gaming with you. And those communities are full of people who want to play the game. Last game I played, I had a player in Australia. Uh, thank you, Dio, for joining. And I thanked Thaddeus last episode for kind of pushing me to keep moving. Thank you, Dio. You are keeping me going. So you're nagging me and pushing me to schedule more plays, and I'm going to. And I appreciate that because that impetus is what's going to keep me could keep me playing. But uh, I digress. So we have one player in Australia, one player in Illinois, one player in Tennessee. You have me playing down here, and we had another fellow in Kentucky. And so the point the more the point is we're having people all over the world come together, where the community, my locale, it may not be that big for old school gaming, but Earth is pretty big. So the beauty of that game, and what I would encourage you to do, if you're looking to play, looking to get into one of these games, check out your local environment. Uh, if you're capable of running, see if you can recruit some people. But worst case scenario, 
jump onto some of these discords, look into some of these looking for group channels, and see if you can't find uh, a pickup gaming server. Because do that, you can pick and choose the people you want to play with. You don't have to go with every creeper in their uh, self-insert fantasy character. It's, it's a good way to get in, and the only way to start playing is to find a game to play in. In any case, that's my really long story of 25 years or so worth of trying to figure out how to answer that question. How do I get into, and or how do I run a game? And condense that down into 15 minutes. So here's the here's the hoping game on readers if you can't if you're not in a game join one if you uh, th have an idea have a map that you want to throw some people at throw at don't let the like I said last time don't let the lack of answers prevent you from tackling the questions run the game join the group play the game worst case is you waste an evening and have to find a new one next time delve on everybody Thank you for listening. The Click Square Ring Mail podcast is an independently owned and operated product released for educational and informative purposes under the Totally Steal This license, which is kind of like Creative Commons, except f licensing. Segments recorded within a vehicle are recorded using a Bluetooth hands-free device in conjunction with local vehicular safety legislation. The music for the Clear Square Ring Mail podcast is Gold Coffee by Michael Ramirez C. Retrieved from Mixkit.co and used under the Mixkit royalty-free music license. Sound effects used in the Clear Square Ring Mail podcast are also retrieved from Mixkit.co and used in accordance with the Mixkit-free sound effects license. Clear Square Ring Mail does not describe to nor endorse views or opinions expressed by call-ins, guests, or even the host, unless you think they're awesome, and thus does not assume any liability regarding the consumption or distribution of this podcast. By listening to the Clear Square Ring Mail podcast, you agree to these provided terms. Parties with questions regarding these terms, conditions, or releases are encouraged to reach out to Clear Square email at the prescribed methods provided on the Clear Square email blog. Parties dissatisfied with these terms, conditions, or releases are encouraged to go suck an egg.